So this was our interview with Garnet. And as we've heard from him, the brand um, or what we call practice is not necessarily really important, um, but the attitude is. Uh, and so in the next two and a half hours and a bit, uh, we will learn from four different researchers about how they use participatory methods in their research, um, in building communities, um, and as you will see also just for a lot of other different purposes. Um, right, so as um, we briefly mentioned before the case actions that we have planned in our consortium, and gender, youth, and openness, they will all be organized in participatory manners. So in the next two hours, uh, we can hope that uh, we will learn new types of engagement um, from these practitioners, from the researchers. Um, and each researcher will have um, 20 minutes to present. Uh, and these presentations will then be followed uh, by a 10 minute Q&A. So we would like to remind you that we have a mirror board. Uh, the link is, a, 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 it should be available to everyone by now. Um, and we would like to ask you to share um, your questions over there in the mirror board. And now uh, we are going to come to uh, Angelika, Angelika Strohmeier. I can already see her name here in Zoom. Hi. And um, she should not forget to unmute herself um, while she's telling us about her practice and also um, about her new book, which is called Digitally Augmenting Traditional Craft Practices for Social Justice, The Partnership Quilt. Over to you, Angelika. Thank you very much um, for that introduction <laughs> um, and, and also for the, um, for the invitation. Um, that that video we just watched was brilliant, um, <laughs> and I'm a bit uh, a bit sad I'm not talking about zines now as well because I love a good zine. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about something slightly different. So let me just um, share my screen because I have a couple of slides, and just cut me off if I talk too long. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so as, as Regina said, my name is Angelika Strohmeyer. I'm a lecturer at Northumbria University School of Design and I work in the UK, um, so in, in England specifically, in the Northeast. Um, today, I, I will try to talk you through some of the projects I've worked on in the last few years, um, some of which have been collaborative and participatory, but some of them have also been more individual and personal to explore meanings of this participatory work for myself as an academic working in participatory ways. So unlike this colorful picture by artist Sarah Coey, whose art has been an endless source of inspiration for me during the pandemic, um, most of the projects I'm going to talk about relate to textiles, some to technologies, and increasingly their kind of multidisciplinary approaches that combine methods of making, thinking, collaborating, and entangling of various different worlds. These will include projects that relate to fieldwork, but also some that help me think about research in new ways that allow me to unpick my own involvement in a project or that have engaged others during difficult times. So there is a short section in my talk where I talk directly about violence against women just because of the nature of my research. Um, and I'll point out again when we get there, it should only be a minute or so, but just, just in case you have any experience that might be triggered, um, feel free to step out for that minute. Um, generally, I'm interested in feminist theories um, and feminist theory development in relation to digital interaction and making. Um, and I do that in a context of violence prevention with and through the development of new, sometimes digital, sometimes not service development. Um, I often do this work through practical and participatory research with support organizations, often women's support services, but also services for people of all genders, um, particularly sex workers. I've worked with homelessness um, organizations, um, um, alcohol addiction organizations. So all, all kinds of organizations that work with people who are made marginal or stigmatized in society. Um, so I often do this work through practical and pragmatic projects, such as this photo is, um, is taken from one of my projects called the Red Umbrella Archive, where I worked with sex workers to develop a community archive around international day to end violence against sex workers. But when I write about this work, um, I often do that in a more theoretical way, exploring its meanings as an academic who works with 
the third sector organization or community groups. I've loved sewing and embroidery for many years, um, but as my work life and personal life started to come together as a whole, I started to use my creative practice to think through and reflect on my research more and more. I draw on literatures ranging from research through design to participatory sewing practices, and also things like living in a post-coding world from methodology. I also started to experiment more with my sewing practice as analysis. And of course, I'm also super inspired by craftivist movements led by Brett Greer and Sarah Corbett. During working from home, or rather being at home in the workplace during the pandemic, thoughts about my research and other aspects of academic work have started to spin around my head as I was sewing kind of in my spare time. When I realized this, I started to more specifically use my embroidery practice to document my experiences of academia, online meetings with partners, and my work at that kind of theory praxis nexus. So here I've chosen five embroidery hoops to illustrate my thinking. And these pieces relate to the mess in collaborative and social justice oriented research projects that I work on and how theoretical and pragmatic issues intersect with one another. These range from bringing together disparate pieces of my heart that make me up as a full person, or the ways in which my research and reading often lead me to overthink. In the bottom right hoop, I reflected on the many loose threads that arise in the research process, and in the top middle, I thought about the many interlinking paths that we take with others when doing our work and how those intersect with others' paths. Perhaps my favourite piece is the one in the top left, with the many intersecting light blue spirals, but I'll come to that again later. However, my thinking about work in this way was not a personal activity. I did this in conversation with others. First, a few years ago with one of my PhD supervisors, Professor Liz Todd, and of course with my really good friend and collaborator, Janice Meisner. And in following years in conversations with others like Charlotte Bilby, Dr. Mirna Guha, um, among many others, as I settled into the disciplinary quirks of starting my role as a member of staff in a design school, when previously I'd worked in computing departments and criminology departments. And in the last year, perhaps perhaps a little bit unknowingly, um, talking to Dr. Miriam Sturdy, Dr. Kata Spiel, and Professor Isabel Naguera played an integral part to my development of thinking about these kinds of embroidery hoops as part of my practice, or even as an artist, perhaps, or maker, I'm not sure, um, but developing that identity and thinking through its meanings. But this kind of thinking started off with a partnership quilt project where I worked with professional quilters, as well as women who use and facilitate support services to sew a digitally augmented quilt to express their experiences of service delivery. I've written and talked about this project extensively at this point, so I won't go into too much detail here. Um, but in this project, a social service provider, professional quilters, my friend Janice, and I worked over a year to sew a quilted blanket that we turned into an interactive one through the use of capacitive touch sensors. Among many other things, this project changed my research trajectory, built a genuine partnership between the organization and myself, and also bonded the two of us together to further explore the relationship of craft and making with trauma responsive service delivery. But importantly, it also fused two big interests of mine, research and sewing. And that kind of led that organization and me onto this really strange path that we're still on today. So it was a long a starting point of a long journey that I'm still on to understand the relationship between sewing and research and the approaches that critical making and critical research can bring when thinking in this way. So to document some of my thinking about this project, I started to create a small hand-sewn quilt where stitches, fabric choices, and shapes represented different aspects of the research. Realizing that this practice was helpful for my thinking, as well as my own well-being, I started to create little quilted pieces that represented each of the three explorations I worked on during my PhD. I started to think about fabric choices, stitches, and already started to explore things around finished and unfinished research and craft. Because in participatory projects, often ending relationships or finishing projects is a really, really hard thing to do and something that I haven't always done well. So this thinking translates into these little quilts I created as part of the project. And originally they were supposed to be nice and neatly finished pieces, 
But as I was working on them, while I was writing up the research, and as I was thinking with the sewing, I realized that having a nicely finished piece did not make sense in these settings. The research itself was participatory. It was not nice and clean and tidy, and it wasn't finished with a nice red bow on the outside. It wasn't something that could be easily framed or hung up. It wasn't something that was easy to write about. So instead, it included open-ended questions, unfinished emotional business, and some threads of the relationships continue on to this day, which is why I've actually chosen in, in this particular instance to not finish the quilted piece and leave it as two halves that are finished but not sewn together yet. Since then, though, I've developed my thinking and practice in ways where it's perhaps a bit more cerebral and less directly related to the research projects and more metaphoric. And this started as I was writing that book Regina introduced called Digitally Augmenting Traditional Craft Practices for Social Justice, which builds on the partnership quilt project I previously talked about. In the book, I think about think about and with metaphors of sewing, textiles, scenes, and research practice in justice-oriented participatory settings. But my thinking of sewing as practice with and for participatory research also continued as I needed something to do with my hands while attending a seemingly endless barrage of virtual meetings, conferences, and events during the pandemic. So when starting an embroidery project, I first open up my box of threads. Some of these are organized neatly, while others are a mess, which is very similar to my understanding of academic theories and practices. Next, I choose some of the colors and start by cutting off a piece of thread from the spool. Then I must unpick the six individual threads that make up a piece of embroidery floss and choose how many of these I want to use for the next part of the piece. Just like when I have to unpick research ethics, methodologies, and when engaging as a feminist, also my own standpoint and relation to the research setting and context as a privileged academic. Like in an action research project or a participatory action research project, I can have a plan at the start of my, my embroidery or at the start of the project, but I must be flexible enough to change that plan based on what my hands and the hands of others produce and make and do. Just like in my research practice, it is seldom that I follow a plan from start to finish in my embroidery without going down new paths, rewalking paths and taking a step back to pause, tie off the threads and start over. Sometimes I have to flip the project on its head, its theoretical pinning, underpinning to get a new perspective, to actually understand what it is I'm doing just like I did in this blue spiral hoop here, where I literally flipped over the fabric and used the back as the front and the front as the back. The majority of my research, as I already said, is collaborative. And the projects themselves usually include other researchers, but, and more often than not, include third sector organizations or other non-academic partners and community groups. For example, at the start of April, 2020, I worked on a project called Sewing Through the Pandemic, where a women's support organization and I worked together to develop a sewing kit for women at the start of lockdown to document their thoughts and feelings in a mindful way, where each color represented a different emotion, helping these women who live really complex lives name and document their feelings in a way that is also mindful and giving them a little bit of, little bit of rest and reprieve. It wasn't supposed to solve any of the huge problem the women were facing due to lockdown, but it gave people a reprieve from their reality or even just a few minutes a day. And the photos you see here are some of those results. Very surprisingly, it also offered staff new opportunities and engagement with the women they support and provided them with a kind of purpose in their jobs when they were no longer able to do them how they used to. And so this was really unintended and we were quite surprised to hear staff say that it gave them this new purpose when they had to reimagine ways of supporting people in these remote COVID secure or COVID enabled ways of working. So this collaborative approach, even when being remote, was intended to support solidarity, hope and care for one another at a time that is incredibly isolating. And there is no difference of collaborative practice in my own critical making as well. Even when I make pieces in isolation in, a, in our spare bedroom come home office and making, sp and making space in a way during the pandemic, 
these are never made in isolation. They are metaphorically, theoretically, and physically co-constructed in conversation with others, by writing and thinking with others, and by learning from those who give up their time to help me better understand. This has included many uncomfortable conversations, conversations that left me emotionally raw, mentally drained, but it also includes conversations that have made me excited, carefully curious, and many have left me remembering that I must always continue to learn and unlearn oppressive practices, well, learn unoppressive and unlearn oppressive practices of academia. I truly believe in the co of research and making of academia. For me, it's about the collectives of thinking, writing, learning and unlearning that give me hope for, for our world and academia specifically in design and technology research when we are met by histories of abuse. And in my research, this co relates to co-writing, co-thinking, co-working, co-caring, co-designing, whoops. Um, and of course, also co-making, among many other things. So to illustrate this, I want to share with you a work in progress I'm currently working on, how paths have crossed time and time again, only to really meet properly very recently. A Brazilian sound artist and I have been in conversation for the last few weeks after I initially found out about her work a few years ago when she submitted an abstract for a journal special issue I was putting together on feminist human computer interaction with some friends and colleagues. Sadly, her proposal was unsuccessful, but over a little of, of, over a little year, a year later, I was able to invite her to write a piece for another venue I co-edited. After this, we finally talked in a video call and realized our practices, while, inter while disciplinarily incredibly far apart, relate to one another in strange ways. So the piece is not finished, but I'm working on it as part of a conversation we're having via email and as a kind of letter I am sending her to draw on her thinking while listening to her art. Often what comes out of our critical making practices are these wonderful, beautiful artifacts but what happens when we look beyond that outcome and think about the emotional, tactile, hard processes of making them? For me, looking at the back of embroidery hoops or at the seams of patchwork pieces is one way of asking these deeper, more personal questions of the process. So let's have a bit of a look at this particular piece and what was happening in the weeks I've been working on putting down the stitches and while making all of those little French knots. I was also working on this piece not only to think about, think about feminist artivism, as my collaborator calls it, but also during what was probably one of the hardest weeks of the year for me as a woman living in England. So this is the part where I talk about violence for a minute. Um, and I'm not sure how much of this came through international media channels, but in a single week in the UK, the Meghan, um, the Meghan Mark Markle interview aired where she shared her experiences, followed by a barrage of hateful and racist comments aimed towards her again. The remains of a murdered woman, Sarah Everard, were also found the following day, who was thought to have been murdered by an off-duty Met police officer. Followed by police violence at a vigil organized for Sarah, and many, many stories of violence against women and girls being shared on social media and friendship groups. To make matters worse for that week, it was all in one week, that week was bookended by International Women's Day on Monday and Mother's Day in the UK on Sunday. All of this while actively working on research projects that address different aspects of violence and trauma it was not a good mix for me that week. So that weekend I was unsettled, angry. It reminded me of the Black Lives Matter movements the previous year and other instances of police brutality and how violence against women and girls has increased during the pandemic. I retreated into my working room with a wall of embroidery hoops in front of me, one of them telling me to exhale, which read more like a passive aggressive and tokenistic approach to institutional well-being than the caring workshop in which I created it. I looked beyond this and started to paint. I painted these three pieces that weekend, all of them using the spiral once again. But as I was painting them, I was thinking about women's safety, the many near and not so near, near misses I'd experienced when walking down the street, the demeaning comments I've heard about me and my work, times my bodily and emotional boundaries had been crossed. But I was also thinking about spirals and violence. It seems every time there is an incidence, 
against a woman, this is seen as an isolated one, rather than seen as part of wider ecologies of violence that we live in, rather than seeing it as a part of the oppressive systems of patriarchy, of men's violence towards women, or how small microaggressions play into larger violent experiences, and how we pinkwash this experience in support for women without addressing the root causes of this violence. I asked myself questions like the one I've written in the second image, how many times have I walked home alone at night like Sarah Everard did the night she was murdered? How many times have I walked with quick steps while clenching my phone in my coat and in one hand while holding my keys between my knuckles in the other, wondering if that would protect me if something were to happen? While this was a personal activity, the practice was part of wider conversations and helped me unpick some of the experiences of those with whom I work. To reflect on the ways my participatory research impacts me as a person, not as a researcher. That weekend, I didn't know what I wanted to paint, but I came back to a known shape, structure and metaphor, the spiral. And in her book, based on her explorations of spirals, Louise Bourgeois writes that the spiral is an attempt at controlling the chaos. It has two directions. Where do you place yourself? At the periphery or at the vortex? And this shape, metaphor, and way of being, the spiral, also helps me think about my participatory research. Looking towards the end of research projects now, as I've alluded to before, often leaves loose ends for participants and myself emotionally, methodologically, theoretically, or pragmatically. Just like movements towards more socially just worlds, my research and practice are a constant work in progress. The intersections of this work also lead to many different layers of meaning that are embedded in collaborative design and collaborative making projects. Participatory action research projects follow cycles, or perhaps spirals, of learning, thinking, doing, and acting, where each cycle of the process require, requires elements of rethinking and redoing. Taking a critical feminist stance on this kind of action work, it also requires undoing and unlearning, it requires breaks in the work, time to digest and understand, time to hold the tensions. And this is where embroidery, painting and patchwork sewing come in for me. I'm sure as time goes on, my repertoire of making and research will continue to grow, but it's this critical making with others that gives me the space to pause, make and unmake, and hopefully also does this for the collaborators with whom I work. It entangles threads and thoughts with one another, not just for us individually, but as a collective working on a project. This leaving of loose ends of unpicking and thinking about histories that come before me, of course, also relate to another aspect of my research, bringing technologies into conversation with feminist theories and practice. The hoop you see here is particularly directed at improving inclusion in academia, technology research, and the design school in which I work. It is a response to a question I was asked by a more senior colleague after I talked about some contemporary issues of sexism and racism in human-computer interaction at a workshop in, a, in the summer of 2020. And at that talk was in response to a series of blog posts on the ACM Interactions website about these experiences across our global community. And the question was, but where do we start? And this particular question is a pet peeve of mine. Often, especially with work related to social justice and equity in research, the answer to this question is that the work already started, usually a long time ago. Those wanting to do work with or from positions of power able to create systemic change simply haven't looked in the right place, or we haven't seen the work that is going on. In more extreme cases, the work is seen and misinterpreted and pushed aside as critique or complaint rather than understood as acts of care that contribute to proactive hope for better futures. Similarly, when we talk about feminist research in design and critical making, the question here should not be where do we start or even whose work can we build on? Perhaps the question should be around conversations. Which conversations outside our disciplines do we wish to engage in? Who needs to be involved in this conversation? How do we translate them into languages of design and making? And how do we meaningfully incorporate these conversations into our ongoing developments of practice, theory, and method? And that's the kind of questions I want to leave you with today. I realize I've gone a little bit over, 
Um, but thank you very much for listening to me. And I'd really love to hear what you're thinking about. Um, and if any of this has been interesting, really quick, a bit cringy plug, um, you can pre-order the book and there's a discount code because it is quite expensive because it's academic, sadly. Um, but there is a discount code on, on the slide there as well. Not cringy at all. Thank you so, so much. And also thank you for sharing the code. <laughs> So of that's a little bit cheaper. I um this was a um I think for a lot of us a very emotional presentation, and I really, really appreciate um the vulnerability, the openness, the the honesty um regarding all of the all of the things that have been going on. Um and um yes, I um one of the projects reminded me of the of this book uh, that is one of my favorite books called Dear Data, um, where two um female researchers are exchanging data visualizations that they draw by hand um every week or so for a year. Um I just yeah, really appreciate the 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 visualization, but also then the time that you know one takes to kind of just reflect. Um and work uh, and work work things out. Um, we if I have a a research point of view question for you, so I'm going to leave that for later because we actually have a question here in the mirror for you. Um, well, there is a little note. Uh, someone says that they love the idea of having a nicely unfinished piece. <laughs> and we have a question um, from Claire Murray. Uh, great talk, uh, Angelica. Yes. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, experiment, the experiences of, uh, for example, trauma survivors in your work underpins everything, but it can also risk breaching trust. Communities outside academia understandably can struggle with the almost clinical academic reports of their lived experiences and pain. I wondered how you approached this in your work. Also, um, they love carefully curious, such a beautiful concept. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. I completely agree with you. Um, and actually, one of the reasons I started integrate making into my research is exactly that. Um, I just realized that it gives people like at the beginning, it was giving people the space to be quiet together, to not have to speak. Um, and it not being awkward <laughs> when you're not speaking, because um, there, there is real power in silence in research processes as well. Um, but actually what came out with the partnership quilt is that um, there are stories that need to be told and people want to tell their stories. Of course, not everybody and we shouldn't force anyone to, but the people that do want to tell their stories um, often do so. And the organization I worked with, they deliver, for example, training to police officers and training to nurses and a lot of other staff who might be in touch with the people they support, but might not take a trauma-informed approach to that way of working. Um, and as we were working on the quilt and embedding the touch sensors into it, it actually allowed us to share people's stories in an anonymous way where, you know, they didn't have to share their identity. There was no need to share their backgrounds. Um, you didn't have to see their faces, but you could hear their voices. And in the voice, you can hear emotion and you can hear um, in the UK, often cultural background, class background is often in, in the accent on the voice. So um, you could hear all of that without knowing who was speaking. And often when they do the kind of training that they do, they have these videos because the people who get the training always want case studies. They want people's lived stories so they can understand the trauma. And it is, it is like it's a really weird thing to work in. Really weird. Um, but we thought with the, and those videos often are like to keep people anonymous. You know, you have like dark shadows over people's faces and filmed from the back and it's all, it's so dodgy, um, but it's like, it's what works. Um, so with the quilt, what we actually talked about, and we haven't tried this, but what we talked about is what if you had a police officer sat on a comfy chair with this blanket over their legs and some headphones on, and when they touched pieces of the quilt, they listened to women's real stories of how they interacted with police. Like, that would be so powerful. And it wouldn't um, have that, like, dark shadow to anonymize somebody. 
um, because that person is immediately anonymous because they are part of this quilt, they are part of the fabric, that story is part of the fabric that they have close to their body that they're being intimately interacting with, with their hands and their touch. Um, so it's, it's like a way of rethinking that trauma in the research process and really honoring those experiences rather than writing a clinical report and finding statistics about it, it is putting it in front of people and forcing people in powerful positions to interact with it in, in a way. Yeah, I love that, turning that around, trying to see how, you know, also what kind of, you know, it just has a different impact on the people sitting on the other side. Um, if it's not a, yes, a clinical, clean, yeah. some sort of a storytelling, so to yeah. say. That's, that's where I'm trying to go, like trying to do that at the moment. Yeah, see if it works. <laughs> We have another question for you, Anonymous. Um, can you share about your process of emancipating yourself from academic power structures and traditional ways of researching? Um, or do you feel held in the academic sphere in your uh, ways of working? And this actually also is exactly what I, want, what I, was, what I wanted to ask you when I was applying for my, um, for my scholarship uh, to go uh, and meet uh, critical making communities in Indonesia, I could tell that the panel of, uh, of, of older men in front of me were kind of shocked that I was so also just emotionally engaged in, you know, getting to know these communities. And this is something that you also mentioned before. Um, and the question that I was asked was, okay, but uh, if, I'm, if I'm there and doing all this participatory action research, who is then going to be um, the objective part in this research? <laughs> yes, <laughs> the struggles <laughs> are real. Um, I guess this has kind of like a two part answer. One is like the informal and one is the formal structures. And informally, um, I've had a lot of like personal, actually, no, wait, this is research learning that I needed to do because um, I have a social science background with from education, actually, which is very clinical trial, which I never liked that I never saw the purpose in. Um, but no, th there is lots of purpose in it, but not for what I want to do. Sorry. Um, but it's yeah. So like that unlearning of actually, no, you can do work in this way. Um, has been a long process and it's still often I, I feel like what I'm doing is not research um, when it very clearly is. Um, but and this is where it starts to get into a bit more the formal. Moving into a design school has been a life changer um, and being around people who just get it um, and who also work in this way has been like a huge emotional boost and a confidence boost and um, actually going out and saying no this is research and this is a way of doing it and this is how we do it in our school at least like certain parts of our school is is really phenomenal um, and having the partners that really get it and that took a long time so I've worked with a lot of organizations and some you know don't see it and that's okay and then we do a project together and it works and it's fine and then that's kind of done and that's okay um, but this one organization I work with, who I did the quilt with, they just get it and they love it and they do it and they were doing it before I joined and they're doing it more now that I'm working with them. And it's just this really nice synergy um, that just works. Um, and a lot of that is a lot of free labor from everybody involved. So that's where the like formal structures are super hard. <laughs> So informally, I'm now at a point where like, this is great, it's working, we've got relationships, it's all like, everyone's kind of on board. But formally getting funding to do this kind of stuff is hard. Um, yeah, I've had a year of rejections, um, so many. <laughs> um, but like, it's, I guess that's part of academia. Um, and, you know, continuing to work in it and continuing to, to have hope in it, I think is, is really important. And just yesterday I was talking to someone about how can we infrastructure that hope. You know, we talk a lot about infrastructuring and, and hacking and making and tech communities, but how do we infrastructure ourselves to be able to do work in this emotional and creative way? Um, and what do we need around us formally and informally and structurally? Um, so yeah, funding is hard. Um, people don't get it, but the communities that do get it 
is the ones I try to stick in um, and building those coalitions um, that I was talking about as well, like with Fem Power Tech, which I didn't mention, but was on my slides that that's been amazing. It's like a, fe it's a feminist technology collective um, international in academia and outside um, that anyone is welcome to join little plug. Um, but it's yeah, having a group of people who just even if they don't fully get it, support you in, in doing it um, is really powerful. Empower tech. Lovely. Thank you so, so, so much. Unfortunately, we have to move on to the next one. Not unfortunately, the next uh, presentation is going to be very interesting too. Thank you so, so much for your input. Um, sorry that it took a bit longer. Really, really appreciate it once again. Thank you. Thank you very much as well. See you soon. <laughs> See you soon. Thank you so much. Um,